Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jeremy, this is John, uh, we're here from the UK, we work at a software company called Jux, we love open source, and we love uh, uh, simple tools and we love closure. Um, so yeah, we're so here today to talk about temporal, data, te temporal databases for streaming architectures. Yeah, so quick question, uh, has anybody heard of a tool that we've built called Crux? Just a hands up. Cool, it's a, it's a good spread. Okay, so anybody actually used Crux, cloned it or downloaded it? Wow, okay. I was kind of expecting like one or two, but there's a few. Um, we have a point of housekeeping. We have some t-shirts here for Crux. If anybody wants one at the end, just come and pick one up. It's this lovely sort of beautiful t-shirt here. And I, I'd love just to do this. It's a lifetime ambition just to throw a t-shirt into the crowd. So. Is anyone going to catch? <laughs> you go. Congratulations. <laughs> so, <laughs> so our talk today, uh, obviously that title is quite concise. Uh, if we were to put it slightly more um, in bigger terms, uh, sorry, you might say, how do we handle time in a streaming architecture? Yeah, and this, this talk is really, um, it's, you know, it's not as pronouncing how thus it should be done. This is more the experiences that, that we've got of, you know, we like event streams, we like these architectures, and then we typically run into this problem of how to handle time. So uh, this talk uh, will give, give uh, those experiences, those lessons that we've learned, and also leading up to uh, why we built Crux and Crux. So, yeah, Crux. It's, uh, it's a big thing for us, um, and uh, we'll come on to exactly how it works and why it's great. Um, but first, we need to start back at the beginning. So streaming architectures, event streams, um, why are they great? I mean, we love them. We, we, we think they embody a lot of principles that we like about closure, about immutability, about um, consistency. Um, and, and they really offer us uh, a way of thinking about how we should be build, building systems in the future. Yeah, I mean, so I say, like, we love event streams, just the simplicity, the decoupled nature of the architecture that, that, that you end up with. And, the way that you can extend these architectures, these, you, know, you have an event stream and then you have these lightweight components around it that do one thing and one thing particularly well, a bit like the Unix uh, philosophy. Uh, and of course this whole modern concept of event streaming really started with the, the release of uh, Kafka, um, popularized around the, the community that evolved around that, including the likes of Martin Kleppmann who got up on stage and said actually when you have this Kafka-based streaming architecture it actually sort of resembles this unbundled view of uh, a database across your enterprise. You know, once you put all your canonical information into Kafka, uh, everything else is just just a view on that. So all your existing databases, all your existing applications, they're just they're just materialized views. Um, what matters is that your 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 Kafka streams are durable, and uh, and then you can replay everything and fix all your mistakes and and go back in time and do whatever you need to to um, to get that flexibility in your architecture. And this really means that your your streams are like the central nervous system for your for your application. So that's a quick history lesson. Um, yeah, just to make this sort of obvious, to restate this obvious point, like we love events streams and we love the log, but the log is not enough. Like you have this stream of facts, these facts come off the log, and they're great, they're interesting, but uh, what we often want to do is collate those facts and look at them over a span of time. So you might have a trader, for instance, that yes, a trade goes through, that's an interesting fact, that one trade, but how are these trades coming together to represent how I did during the day? Like, have I made a profit or a loss? how my trades done throughout the last year. It's really time when it comes in that brings that meaning to the facts that are on these, uh, these logs. And to make that more specific, uh, we really just think of the log as, as storage. You know, the, the log is an append-only sequence of records. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, an implementation of this sort of high-level uh, concept of an event stream uh, where you know, it's just a sequential order of events that are unbounded. Um, but a log is just an append-only sequence. And, when we think about logs, we think about ingestion time primarily. The, the events that go onto our log are, um, we're, we're definitely recording the ingestion time. We, we know the order that they're ingested, but that's not the same thing as the event time. And often we need to extract the event time information from outside, of, uh, from within the records. So the, the question then is, how, how do we, um, how do we make Kafka this this uh, you know, this lovely sort of uh, database foundation, this thing that's, that's acid? It, you know, it, it ticks all the boxes for acid in in, uh, in Martin's. Uh, view of the world, but it doesn't provide queryability. So how can we add a, a, a sort of generic layer to, to interpret the actual order of events on top of uh, the, the event streams? Um, and then from an information model perspective, just, just adding information isn't enough. We need to be able to change what we know, uh, invalidate information, or, or perhaps even delete it altogether, depending on you know, if we have legal requirements, that sort of thing. Which leads us to bitemporality. 
So bi-tone plurality is um, it's a problem that you don't always know that you have. And I, I speak from this personally. It's like you build these event streaming systems, and then the events come in, and you want to make sense of them. And then you, you quickly run into this problem. So we actually spoke to someone the other day, and they were like, I don't understand what the fuss is. It's just two timestamps. That's kind of true, but the devil's in the detail. Um, so bi-temporality is, is just defining time on two different axes. So let's go through what they are. Do you want to press that? So first we have transaction time. And transaction time is just saying this is when a fact is transacted. So I think people know this, but if we have an event log, it's when that event was transacted onto the log. Um, that's good news. Um, and then this gives us like an audit log, saying we have all our events there, we've got them forever, we're safe in the knowledge that they're audited. You know, they're there for audit. Um, so the other thing it gives us is consistent queries. So yep. we have um, transaction time. You know, this, is, this is the key to saying, well, all your materialized views could be at different points in the history. Um, but as long as you know the point that that materialized view is at, then, then you know that actually you're always going to get the same result out of it. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing because if you query as of a point in transaction time, transaction time, the past doesn't change, so those queries will always give the same consistent results. Then we have valid time, and this is not when a fact is transacted, but this is when a fact is said to be true. So if I go back to that trading example, imagine you have like a big enterprise, uh, there's a, you know, it's offices across the world, and a trader enters in a trade, and that's when they think this, this trade is true, this, uh, this fact this trade is made is true at this time. But then this, this trade sort of weaves its way through the enterprise, through different time zones, and finally gets to our event stream. And this is when it's transacted. And I've been in a situation where you, you, know, you might argue with the trader because the trader's like, hey, I'm doing this query as of this point in time, but I can't see my trade, I know it's there. And you're like, well, you know, our system didn't see it, it wasn't transacted. But they're like, yeah, but it's, that's when it happened. That's when it actually happened. Why can't I see it? So it's this valid time. It's when a fact is true that the business really cares about. The other um, great thing about valid time is that valid time is more forgiving. It's more fungible. You can insert into valid time past. So if you imagine that trading example, imagine you have a trader that has a system they enter their trades into, but then there's another trade that they write on a piece of paper, and it goes through a slightly different system, um, and it might turn up like an hour later, but uh, they want it to apply to the past. They want to insert it into that valid time past. And if we've only got transaction time that's always increasing and we have to respect transaction time, we can't do that. So valid time gives us that uh, sort of more meaningful time that business care about and that we can uh, work with the past with. Yeah. And it's when you bring these two things together that you get the beautiful combination of bi-temporality. Yeah. So you can query as of valid time, but then you can also query as of transaction time, put those two together to get the consistent view of the timeline that people really care about. Yeah, and so this, this bi-temporal modeling is, is not like a new concept as such. Um, people have been doing this for, for decades, especially in heavily regulated industries and in financial services or insurance. The, the, you, the regulations require that you store an audit log of everything that's going on. So they, they had to keep transaction time long before that was fashionable. Um, and equally, they, they needed this, this, this valid time view of, you know, when was my insurance policy valid? So these, these concepts aren't new, really. Um, they've been implemented in many databases, in many ad hoc ways across the world. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of those systems are still ticking on fine. Um, but a lot, of it, a lot of it is handcrafted. And, and uh, so for decades, people have been adding new columns to their relational schemas that, you know, this is when it was valid from, this is when it was valid to, this is when it was updated, and they never delete the rows in their tables. And these are really hand-rolled solutions, and they, they force you to make upfront decisions about which table is, is going to have these properties, and then how do I rewrite my SQL statement, and how do I add, in, add indexes to, to accommodate this fact? So this handcrafted nature of, of bi-temporality is what drove people to add temporal support to the SQL standard. So 2011, we had a whole bunch of new operators. You could do this as of time querying in SQL. Um, but the reality is no one's really using that in earnest. Like, there definitely are users, and the database vendors have picked up you know, this, this standard, but they're implementing it to different degrees, and it's still quite a complex thing to, to have to decide, right, I'm going to make this bi-temporal. Like, it's something you have to cognitively, cognitively think about in order to, to, to apply it, um, rather than it just being a, a default. Um, and as a result, because the tools for doing this aren't very simple, uh, we argue that bi-temporality is, is an open problem. 
So coming back to the main question, so we've defined uh, how we want to perceive time as, um, how we want to model it, and we like event streams. So how do we put these two together? What are the approaches that we can use to solve this problem? Well, regardless of the approach, we're going to have to stream in the data from, we're going to have to consume that data from our streams. And that could be across uh, one stream, or it could, we could be joining data across multiple streams. And maybe we want to do simple things like a stateless transformation, in which case, easy. Um, but the moment you want to care about um, uh, joining across multiple streams and, and doing sort of more stateful things, you're going to have to have some kind of aggregate state. And maybe you're going to store it locally, maybe you're going to put it up in some big distributed index. Um, but th these are sort of fundamental operations you're going to need. And then we're either going to produce a new event to put it on another event stream, or we're going to expose an API for, for interactive querying. Um, so with that in mind, what kind of approaches can we use for actually building our aggregate state, our materialized view? So one thing we can do is to take a monolithic database, a traditional database, take Postgres, take, uh, take Oracle, um, take, take MariaDB, it has temporal support. Um, or you could just yeah, do, do the, the handcrafted solution again. Uh, th these, are, these are ways to, to address the problem. Um, and certainly if you have temporal support and you think your database does everything you absolutely need to, to do it, it's, it's, a, it's a valid approach. Uh, you get a lot of benefit in terms of development tooling and operational tooling to, to make it happen. Um, but there are some downsides. Yeah. You could use Crux as one of those, but um, it has downsides. These are downsides. Uh, so if you use a database, if you bring in like a monolith, um, you have to consider the cost. So somebody might have to cut a check for like a large enterprise sort of license. And then you have to provide the ongoing support and maintenance and look after those databases. They're quite expensive. Um, and it, but it could also be we're, we're sort of moving away from the philosophy of event streams of having just simple things doing one thing particularly well if we bring in like a huge DB system to take care of our time problem. Um, and then it, it, it might just do too much. It might be a sledgehammer to hit this particular nut. Or it could be that you bring in a DB, one of these at the bottom, and it, it doesn't quite do what you need. And we've been in this situation trying to sort of shoehorn in things like the bi-temporality and other things that, 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 that you absolutely have to have. And then it's, it's like you might need to eventually introduce some other store and then you've got the worst of all worlds. You've got breadth of these different database systems to help you. So it would be good if we could sort of get back to a simpler way. Yeah, and, and one of the problems is that, yeah, what, what, in order to find out if that database is enough, you know, is, is Postgres enough, you have to go down that path and then realize, oh, wait, no, it doesn't have good enough free text search, so I'm going to have to bring in Elasticsearch anyway, in which case you have this proliferation of sort of ad hoc, how am I going to solve the event ordering problem across these multiple databases? Mm -hmm. So you end up with like two monoliths, three monoliths. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is an approach, but it, it does come with this sort of inherent risk. Um, another thing you can do is to, to use stream processing tools. So um, things like, yeah, Kafka Streams, Flink, Samza, whatever, they're, they're very good tools for running things at high scale on top of uh, something like Kafka. So they're, they're inherently built for throughput, and that legacy comes from complex event processing where uh, historically, you know, machines are very small, and they could literally only fit so much information about, like, a, a recent history. Uh, in them, so, so you're really thinking about throughput uh, and in, in that little trade-off between um, cost in terms of retention and latency um, and, and correctness, you know, these, these are really or oriented towards uh, throughput systems. Um, but the good thing is that these systems do have uh, native support for event ordering, so Kafka Streams, you can say, I want to extract my event timestamp out of the record and, uh, and use that to, to manage windowing. So windowing is, is the way you would manage um, sort of valid time using a stream processing tool. But windows are sort of quite a uh, um, mechanical way of thinking about the problem because they, they offer um, you know, the ability to say, well, I want to rearrange the event order for like, the, the events that come in in the last 10 minutes or the last day or the last week. Um, and you can do it, you know, sliding windows, tumbling windows, et cetera. Um, and the only way to really model valid time using this is to take uh, an unlimited window to actually say, I want to make this window go right back to the beginning of time, and therefore I can reorder the events ad hoc using my stream processing tool. So this works. So you can do this in, in, um, in Kafka Streams. But again, there's some downsides. Yeah, I mean, the main downside of a window is that uh, if, if you want to get lots of meaning from it and query across time, you have to widen out the window. And then it's not really a window. It's like it's an ad hoc query tool. It's like a window is really optimized for sitting on that fire hose of data the event's going through and providing you some insight in a windowed way. But if you try and shoehorn in, like, generic query or you know, the ability to look at history, then it's not really what it's built for. And then that's when you get in some performance problems with them.
Yeah, and you have to make decisions like how big should my window be, and you're, yeah. you're always having to make these uh, guesses as you know what you're doing. Like the stream processing tools imply that you have a throughput problem. Where actually, a lot of the time it's a modeling problem, um, and also the windows uh, won't give you the ability to sort of have this bi-temporal state. So within your aggregate, you're not going to be able to say, show me, um, uh, make a decision about how to. Uh, change the state based on the, like the past five states. So you're going to have to maintain that sort of temporal state within the window yourself. So there's a lot, there's a lot there which they don't solve inherently, um, which is uh, why we have really only a third approach um, to, to looking at this. Yeah, this is to, to try and uh, build yourself a materialized view um, and do it in that lightweight way, the unbundled approach, just one thing doing one thing well that ingests from the event stream. And we're going to talk about that now. So, can you, uh, so a case study. So this is something that actually happened. Uh, so we were uh, in a situation a bit like this, so that trading enterprise situation that I described earlier. And here you've got different trading platforms across the world. They're all taking trades. And eventually those trades will come into our stream, our event log. And here you've, you, you can see, I won't point this out in too much detail, but you can see there's a conflict here between valid time and transaction time when those trades were made true versus when they were transacted. So um, this was qu quite a constrained environment. And there was quite a lot of throughput, so hundreds of millions of trades each day. And the traders really wanted this bitemporal capability. So they wanted to do queries to fetch their tra trades for a particular point in valid time. But of course, we need that transaction time for consistency of query. So we had, that, we, we had this use case. Um, they did have a database already that acted as the event log and acted as the query tool, but it was bulging. It was like, you know, the query is breaking down, throwing disk at it, and it was becoming a bit of a troublesome child. So, uh, so what we did, to cut a long story short, is uh, we, we, we wanted to go with this approach of doing something simple. Uh, we didn't want to bring in a whole new DB, because I said it was quite a constrained environment, like it was quite difficult to get things into production to get people to cut checks and things. So we just did something simple. So we took Rocks DB, um, which is a key value store. Very simple. Uh, Rocks is like tremendously scalable. It's built by Facebook. You know, it can have terabytes and petabytes of data. The ingest fast is really, um, the ingest speed is really fast. So it's a great tool. And um, all we really did was, so if you look at the, the first line, the index A, we just created a key value pair. And this is the key. So we had the entity ID, which is the trade ID, and then we had the valid time. And we put these two together in a key, and then the value is the trade. And we're ingesting all of this from this event log that has all of these trades on. Okay? Now, if we were to stop here, so forget B and C, if we were to stop, this is almost like a bitemporal system, right? Because you have uh, the log there, which has transaction time. So if someone wants to query transaction time or get at it, there's a way to ingest uh, the log to get it. But then the traders, the people who actually want this data, they can query as of a point in valid time using seeks across these keys in the KV store. Right. So, I mean, that is just you know, extremely simple. Um, and it, to an extent, it works. But of course, if you just have A, then you can't get consistent query because valid time is this flexible, lovely thing that you can munge and change. But then your queries might be different from day to day or second to second. So that's when you need the transaction time. And this is just a key. So this key in B has these three parts, the entity ID, the valid time, the transaction time. And we're just saying, give me this entity as of this valid time, and just filter out ones whose transaction time is after the, tran the transaction time that I supply to the query when I do my as of. Cool, OK. So now, these people can, traders can get their trades as of a point in valid time with the consistency. That's great, that's useful. Um, but we couldn't do joins or query, so we just added this extra index, which is the index C, and this is like your A, V, E. So give me all of the trades uh, um, that, that have this field called stock and the value is IBM. Just give me all of those. And then uh, this will then give you the candidate entities, candidate trades that at some point have had this field and um, this particular value. And then we go back and we consult the index B to make sure that uh, these trades actually had these values at this particular point in transaction time and valid time, these bitemporal coordinates. And that's kind of, um, that's it. And it's just demonstrating that you can do something really simple 
Like you don't have to go for the full bi-temple database solution. You can start with something as simple as a KV store, you know, something like rocks, and just build something simple up that ingests from the transaction log, and then it gives you some bi-temporal power. Um, this was quite useful. Like we, we wrapped this in a GraphQL layer. So we exposed like a GraphQL front end to the business. And you know, you always get some free points because like you know the UIs are beautiful with GraphQL, so it goes a long way. Um, and it was scalable, like the ingest speed into RocksDB was fast. Uh, we embedded the RocksDB instances into the application node instances. So of course, like you got local query. So uh, the queries are fast as well. And uh, yeah, I think this seeded some thoughts. Like it was a simple way to get that bi-temporality up and running. Um, it was a nice unbundled, flexible architecture. So we went away and we thought, hmm, there's something in this approach. Yeah, and so those, those thought seeds grew and grew and grew. Uh, and we ended up with Crux, which is uh, an open source MIT licensed database that we support as a product. Um, and it gives you this, this capability that we've talked about and, and more. Um, there's a few reasons we really think uh, Crux is, is, is great and things we really wanted to hit when we, when we built it. One was by temporality, of course. Um, another was eviction, which we haven't really touched on, but eviction is quite a, a tough problem, especially when you think about um, streaming architectures. You know, if I want to get rid of data from Kafka, but I still want to preserve replayability, what do I do? And I think every organization has a slightly different approach to this. Uh, and maybe there isn't like a completely general solution, but we wanted within our bubble of crux to solve the eviction problem, just, you know, just have an approach. Um, so we, we thought about this and, 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 and solve this. Um, whereas, yeah, if you go down the stream processing route and store all your state in your, in your Kafka streams thing, you're going to have to evict from those, those materialized um, custom state stores and all that sort of thing. So, so we wanted to keep them lightweight and simple. Another thing we really liked being closureist is uh, data log. Um, so we really wanted data log queries to, um, to, to give us sort of full flexibility and, and do the sort of graph algorithms and stuff if we, if we choose to in the future. Um, and, uh, and the final thing is a, a, an API that actually feels like a database. Um, so, you know, when we think about the unbundled architecture, normally it's like, well, you have these big system components and there's APIs between them and you know, you've got Kafka Connect or whatever. Um, but we, we wanted to give something that programmers can use, sort of, that, that feels much more like a database, even though, you know, you don't actually think about the fact it's a node local to your application and you're talking to, to, to Kafka, there's, that's all abstracted away. Uh, and to make this uh, a reality, we, we extended uh, John's example, which was really just putting data in uh, with uh, three other key operations. And these operations are, are basically all you need to, to do something uh, in, this, uh, in this model. So you want to put, put your documents. Um, you want to be able to delete your documents. And delete is really more like a retraction about that document in valid time. So it's not really deleting, because um, you can always go back to transaction time and see it. But from the valid time view of the world, it, it removes it. Uh, and then with eviction, of course, which I mentioned. And then compare and swap, which is this actual uh, unit of uh, transaction um, primitive, which, which, which you need in order to do complex things, where you have multiple nodes trying to coordinate. Um, and this will make more sense in a moment uh, when I explain the, the diagram. So uh, over on the right, you see we've got a couple of topics. And essentially, those, uh, those topics, that tr transaction log, is really using Kafka as a write ahead log. And we're writing, each node will write transactions um, and those operations which we just discussed to that, to that transaction log. And we don't know if they've succeeded or not uh, until the node is read. Uh, and thanks to transaction time, we can, we can get that consistent query and, and you know, block until uh, our node is caught up. Um, but those operations will pass or, or fail, depending on whether if it has a compare and swap operation, uh, whether it allows, allows it to happen. So you can do um, consistency um, sort of checks and make sure you're not changing something which has changed from underneath you. Um, and then, so those, those uh, transactions are stored in the transaction log, and what's actually in those are, are hashes of the documents. So we've solved the eviction problem by only ever storing the hashes in the transaction log. So the transaction log never gets compacted. It's a single partition, it's linearly ordered, uh, whereas the document, document log or document topic is, is, um, is more mutable. You can remove them, you can just put some eviction tombstones, and that's how we handle this. Uh, so these operations will we'll tell uh, the, the crux node how to, how to, what to do with the, the information that's coming in and whether to add it to the document store, remove something from the document store, and, and build up the indexes. And we see here sort of a, internally quite an unbundled uh, and unpluggable approach. And in each of these lines is essentially a closure protocol, so you can swap things out. And this is how we are able to support RocksDB or LMDB for these different stores. You know, they're just, just a simple key value protocol. Um, so, you know, where you have high ingestion uh, requirements, uh, RocksDB is a great candidate. 
Uh, but if queries, like, you know, you really want like, to get the, the extra 50% performance boost for queries, then LMDB is actually really powerful under the hood. Um, but because of this openness and, and the ability to like, swap out these components, uh, we've already had you know, people out in the field, uh, users of Crux, um, sort of just working off the back of what's on GitHub and, and the docs um, to, to, to do what they need to do to make Crux work for them. So these guys uh, needed to put Crux into an environment on Windows. They tried as hard as they could to get LMDB and Rox to, to build on Windows. They couldn't do it. Um, but then they found uh, Exodus, which is uh, like a JVM-only key value store, and they wrote Crux Exodus, and they published that to GitHub. And, and now they can install their apps uh, yeah, locally on their Windows environments at their clients. So uh, this, this sort of promise of having an extensible database that people can, can quickly build uh, you know, new pluggable components in uh, is, is taking off. Um, and something we've done, uh, sort of having reflected on, on that original architecture, John um, described, you know, that the, the, the ordering of those indexes required sort of scanning over a linear history. So if you have a document with lots and lots and lots of corrections, uh, you're actually going to have this sort of yeah, linear performance uh, impact. So uh, you have a slow down your queries. Um, so something we did that, you know, we went back to academia and we found these algorithms, Litmax and Big Min, and, and we realized we could use these fractal Morton curves to encode these two-dimensional uh, coordinates into a, a single index. So, um, so our point in time query is actually very fast, even for degenerate cases where there's huge amounts of history. And in general, Crux is just designed as a way to um, uh, build, create a database which, which doesn't degrade you know, in, in regards to how much history it has. It shouldn't matter how much history is in your database, the query should always, always be snappy. So what have you made simpler, John? I think that by temporality, uh, you know, is these, uh, these two timestamps, so how hard can it be? But it turns out when you do it at scale, there's uh, lots of detail there. So Crux aims to make your life easier if you're facing the bitemporal conundrum. Uh, then we have eviction, the ability to get rid of data. As Jeremy said, just uh, Crux, uh, Crux is built from the ground up, so you can evict data. Like you've got personal GDPR data that you need to excise, uh, evict, then you can do that. And it's because the content and the transaction logs are split. You know, so the transaction log, is can Completely, um, we can't get rid of the data there, but we can get rid of it, rid of it in the content log. And extensibility, so uh, if Crux doesn't do what you exactly want, if there's a part in Crux you want to swap out and you want to put your own module in, then you can absolutely do that. And we're excited um, already that uh, that's happening to a degree, and uh, Crux will grow to be something bigger and better uh, than what it was uh, conceived initially. So, Great, so this is a screenshot. I'm going to go to the real thing. Pop that there. Um, so on this screen, zoom a little bit. This is our new console. This is our new console, yeah. So um, user interface. So you know, a lot of people will look at Crux and they'll be like, oh, that's, that's closure, that's you know, stuff. I don't, I don't want to have to experiment just to try it. So this is a way to try Crux without having to you know, be brought into closure. Um, so it gives you the power to, to run queries and, and run transactions uh, to, to see what's going on. Uh, so in this view of our database, uh, if I'll, just, I'll just refresh it. So yeah, make sure we're very latest. Uh, so we can see here it's showing us information about attribute frequencies. So this um, is just basically just telling us what's in our database. We can see we've got um, 1,700 and so documents, uh, and these are the cardinalities of the different attributes. And the query engine actually uses this information to optimize the join order um, that it, it runs. Uh, and so we can do various things here. Um, what first thing we want to do is to put data into, into our database. So uh, we can see here we've got um, a transaction. Uh, we have, we're preparing this transaction, and uh, uh, yeah, it contains basically lots of put entries. We've got some nested documents in there. Um, and it's basically some, some information about this, this um, trading market we have. So if we run this query um, and we go to our Eden output, we'll see we've got this um, tra transaction ID here. So this transaction ID is actually uh, the offset from Kafka. Um, and uh, I didn't mention before, actually, so we also have JDBC support. So we've, we've modeled uh, um, the Kafka semantics in JDBC. So if you want to use Postgres as the back end, you don't have to use Kafka. Um, and also you know, SQLite or whatever you want. Uh, anyway, so this offset is, is what gives us the consistent query guarantee. So now if we uh, actually went to like a different console and we, we use that transaction ID to, to query against, we could be absolutely sure it's going to be at the same level. And in this, in this instance, we don't need to do that because it's, um, it's all pointing at the same uh, query node anyway, but uh, in principle, that's that's the that's the way it um, manages scaling. So, uh, so if we just run this query, this find query, so this is what data log looks like. Um, I won't try and explain it. I, I always conceptually like to think it's, it's like a puzzle. 
and it's just filling in the blanks. Uh, and we go to the table view, we can see what's in our um, database. So here we have a huge list of uh, 211 um, documents, and in those documents we can see we've got different attributes here. Uh, and we can do things like, um, uh, yeah, click around and, oh, well, first of all, we see what, what documents don't have which attributes. And um, we can go in here and, and see that uh, this um, NASDAQ uh, marketplace has you know, various stock exchanges listed underneath it. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's got various, uh, so, uh, no, sorry, we're seeing two stock exchanges, uh, one in, um, both in the USA, one in the New York Stock Exchange, one in NASDAQ. Uh, anyway, so we can run these queries. Um, we could also uh, run a query against like a specific ticker price. So maybe we see um, uh, a bunch of ticker prices here. Tech ticker two looks interesting. We can uh, click on that one. Um, and then if we wanted to uh, view the history for that price, um, we can uh, see the valid time history. So in, as we're putting into information to the database, we can actually put different uh, valid time coordinates within the same transaction and import lots of data at once. Uh, and that's what we're looking at here. Um, and we can also do other more complex things. Um, you know, we can add uh, rules and arguments and we say, show me all the ticker data that's between um, uh, 10 and 60, you know, show me all the, all the tickers that are currently between 10 and 60. Um, or maybe we want to um, do some uh, sort of more complex join and, and see the, uh, the tickers which um, uh, are greater than 60 here and are within a particular um, market. So uh, anyway, there's some various capabilities in the, in the console there, and hopefully gives you a flavor of what you can um, do with Crux. Uh, so we'll just return back to the slides, and uh, I'll spend a moment talking about, um, spend a moment talking about what, uh, what's coming up. So um, one of the great things that Martin said in his, um, I think it was the 2014 talk, was about what, to, to really complete the, the streaming architecture vision. Um, it's not just about streaming at the back end, it's about streaming all the way almost to the, to the browser, pushing things through WebSockets. So streaming queries is like a really interesting space. Um, now, the, the Crux query engine doesn't do streaming queries, but there's this great technology called 3DF, which is a closure wrapper around some, some Rust uh, 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 project called uh, Timely Dataflow, Declarative Dataflow, and these, these um, allow you to do streaming data log queries. So what we're working on right now is, um, can we plug this together into Crux and, and give you that end-to-end -end streaming? So you're not just thinking about architectural streaming, you're also pushing queries and the, the new results into the, um, the browser, for instance. Uh, we're also looking into, um, oh, we have, we've built Crux Connect, we're sort of going through that validation process, working on benchmarkings, and we have transaction functions already in there. So I said there are four operations. That's, that's a bit of a lie. If you want to do some sort of um, you know, event store sort of projectional modeling in Crux, you can do that using transaction functions, but that's sort of hidden behind a flag for the moment. But um, you know, we're, we're very interested in this space and thinking about you know, predicates and enforcing schema within the, within the database. Um, but it's also maybe worth saying that uh, you know, trying to think about how bitemporality and eviction work together is, is quite tricky. So that's one of the things we're looking at. Uh, there are lots of other things on our radar. Um, so everything we've talked about right now is like point in time queries. You're saying, I want this valid time, this transaction time. But sometimes maybe you've uh, modeled your data in such a way that actually you need to see um, the change over a range of uh, valid times. Um, so it's almost like a time series use case. So you know, Crux isn't a time series database, but if you had by temporal range queries, that would give you the ability to do efficient time series, uh, especially if you have uh, columnar compression. Um, we're also very keen to like look beyond just you know people wanting to use Crux, uh, putting Eden in and, and, and using data logs. So we're uh, looking at adding SQL support and um, JSON for interaction. Um, and then one of the big constraints with Crux right now is that everything has to fit in a single node. So um, you know that limits exact, exactly how big your streams can be before you have to you know shard over time and sort of use a different node uh, or, a, or a different transaction log. Um, so we're very keen on, on thinking about adaptive indexing and how we uh, scale up the, um, the architecture we currently have. So uh, with that, we have uh, an on session tonight at 7 p.m. Um, I will be there. I don't think John can be there, unfortunately. Um, but we'll have t-shirts and uh, we'll do a demo. I'll show you more stuff about the console. Uh, I'll hopefully get some repls up and running um, and we'll, we'll take more of a, a walk through. Cheers. Thank you. All right. Come and get a t-shirt. Thank you very much.